This is a short video on bacterial infections of the GI tract. And we're going to be talking about six major bacteria that infect the GI tract and uh, how to kind of treat them, how to identify them, special things to associate with them, and the toxins that some of them release that cause the infections. Let's start with Salmonella enterica. This can be broken down by cerevars, which are just like subclassifications, kind of like subspecies. First cerevar, the most important cerevar, is cerevar typhi, which causes typhoid fever. This is a gram-negative, lactose-negative bacteria that requires a low dose to be infectious. It has a low infectious dose. The mode of disease here is enteroinvasive, and it disseminates throughout the body. So it's absorbed through the GI tract, and it can spread throughout the body uh, to other organs and, and cause damage there. Reservoir here is humans only. This can only be spread from human to human, does not infect animals. Symptoms of Salmonella enterica include gastroenteritis. So we do see some inflammatory diarrhea. There's progressive fever, and they're sweating treatment for salmonella enterica. There are some specific antibiotics that they use here, specifically fluoroquinolones and cephalosporins. Some antibiotics have been shown not to work. The cerevar typhi has developed resistance to sulfa drugs with trimethoprim, ampicillin, and chloramphenicols. So they really stick to fluoroquinolones and cephalosporins when treating typhoid fever. There are vaccines available for salmonella enterica, but they're not commonly used in the U.S. And as for the other serifars, the non-typhi serifars, they're also gram-negative, also lactose-negative. It's still Salmonella enterica. They do have a higher infectious dose. It does require a bit more bacteria to cause infection. Also enteroinvasive, they differ in that they do not disseminate. They don't spread, stay pretty close to the GI tract. The other ones, the non-typhi serifars, are infecting animals. They are zoonotic. They cause diarrhea, cramps, vomiting, fever, and intestinal inflammation. Antibiotics for the non-typhi cerevars are usually not necessary. Rehydration is usually enough as a treatment. The body takes care of it itself. Next disease is Shigella. This is, the disease is called Shigellosis. There are three species that are worth knowing. The third one, dysenteriae, causes dysent uh, dysentery. This is another gram-negative, lactose-negative bacteria. has a very low infectious dose. This is another enteroinvasive bacteria, and again, this is a human-only pathogen. It's an obligate human pathogen. So this causes a range of diarrhea from mild to dysentery, which is inflammatory diarrhea. It can also cause abdominal pain, cramps, nausea, vomiting. You do see blood and pus in the stool, as is expected with inflammatory diarrhea, and there is fever. Treatment for this is usually just rehydration. You might consider antibiotics, but usually rehydration does it. It's worth knowing that the Shigella organism releases a toxin called the Shiga toxin, uh, and it's it, it is strongly associated with hemolytic uremic syndrome, HUS. This toxin has two subunits, an A and a B subunit, and its uh, its mechanism is that it blocks glucose absorption. But it, these this uh, toxin has an effect throughout the body, and that's what causes HUS. Next bacteria is Campylobacter. The species name is Jejuni, Campylobacter jejuni. Another gram negative. This one is shaped like a corkscrew rod. It's a micro aerophilic, and it also has a low infectious dose. Another enterovasive, and another zoonotic bacteria. This one also causes inflammatory diarrhea with blood sometimes, fever, and cramping. Treatment again is rehydration. And for Campylobacter, it's worth knowing that it's the most common cause of bacterial diarrhea. So it's the most common bacteria that causes diarrheal diseases. Next, we have Listeria. That's the genus of the next organism. The disease is called Listeriosis. This is a gram-positive bacteria, unlike the other ones that we we're talking about, and it's a modal rod. This one is enteroinvasive, like the others, and it's present in animals. It's zoonotic, like the others. Symptoms include vomiting, fever, muscle aches in mothers, and CNS infection in neonates. Now, the reason I mentioned mothers and neonates is because listeria can cause pregnancy complications. It's worth associating listeriosis with problems with pregnancy that can lead to stillbirth or spontaneous abortions. Treatment for this one is also rehydration. 
And it's also worth associating listeria with dairy and processed meats. So if you hear of an infection and there's dairy involved, there's processed meats and there's pregnancy complications, you can think of listeria and listerios. It's worth associating all those terms. Next is Vibrio cholera, which releases the cholera toxin. This is another gram negative, a facultative aerobe, anaerobe, excuse me, facultative anaerobe. This is enterotoxigenic, so it enters the body. And it's, uh, excuse me, it's enterotoxigenic, so it releases a toxin that enters the body. It doesn't necessarily invade the body itself. This Bacteria does not infect animals, but it can be found on the shells of marine mammals. So it's often found in water, often around marine mammals. It can be obtained from consuming marine mammals, although it does not actually infect the animals. So not zoonotic, but you can still get it from eating animals. Unique symptom here is watery rice water stools. So this is a, uh, a, a diarrhea that can make you very dehydrated. It's a secretory diarrhea. And because it's secretory, because you're losing so much fluid, it can lead to hypovolemic shock and low potassium levels, hypokalemia, uh, within just two days of having uh, cholera toxin affecting your body. This is also an A plus B toxin. This one specifically works by activating adenylate cyclase, which causes the body to secrete ions and water, which causes you to lose a bunch of water through your GI tract. And lastly, we have E. coli. Four main groups of E. coli, ETEC, EPEC, EIEC, and EHEC. Sometimes said ETEC, EPEC, EHEC. These correspond to enterotoxigenic E. coli, enteropathogenic E. coli, enteroinvasive E. coli, and enterohemorrhagic E. coli. E. coli, as you probably know, is a gram-negative lactose-positive facultative anaerobe bacteria. Now, some of them are in humans only, others are zoonotic. ETEC and EIEC are humans only. Symptoms that you see with E. coli include gastroenteritis, so some inflammatory diarrhea. You see some nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, cramps, abdominal pain, indigestion. It's pretty general symptoms of gastroenteritis. Treatment for E. coli is usually just rehydration. Probably don't need antibiotics. It's worth knowing that ETEC causes a cholera-like illness, uh, and that, that's kind of it's kind of the, the, the dehydration, the, the, the major loss of water, treat with rehydration. EHEC, enterohemorrhagic E. coli, is kind of a combination of EPEC, enteropathogenic E. coli, with the Shiga toxin, and that's how it presents. This has been a presentation of bacterial infections of the, of the GI tract, and I hope it was helpful.